Tuesday, June 22nd. Minutes from the last meeting. We'll, we'll pass on, re, on the minutes of the last meeting till the next meeting. Okay. It's there, I hear doors closing. Give it two seconds. No. Ron, is there a Zoom link? Or is it all just on CTB's, CTSB's? It's the same. CTSB, and it's the same link as same it's link been as forever. All right. Anita wants to know. <laughs> so, hi, Joe. Yeah. Come on, Joe. Please share for Joe. Is it possible? You're on TV. Is it possible to do this from home? <laughs> yes. Sort of. Is there a Zoom link? It's the same one that we've had. It's been a repeating. It's a repeating um, link. Okay. Informal. We don't have anybody here from Beaver Solutions. What do we have? Do we have something in the middle of? Oh, it says this is being recorded. Okay. All right. Away. Dumping at Fort Goodrich Street. Do we know anything about that? They. We had a report that the people who are doing the. Um, grounds work at four Goodrich Street are taking the clippings and the grass and the whatever they do and dumping it either in the wetland or close to it, the river. We don't know where it's coming from. Right. It's whatever it's their groundskeeper. Oh, so it's staying on the property, but just going in the wrong place. Right. All right. We'll investigate. 27 Church Street. So he wants to put in a pool. Yes. And I thought that she would be here tonight. By Zoom? Via Zoom? Yeah. Theoretically. Will they show up on the screen if they're... They don't. I can try to log in and let you know who's here. Oh, that's one of the problems with this is you don't see it. It's not like... I'm not here. I've got it up. Oh, you do? Okay. Yeah, you don't see anyone. The only other person is here is Anita Schwarner. Right Hi, Anita. Hi, Patrick. There's no Zoom link on the agenda. Patrick told me to use an old one, and that worked. But it's, the, it's the one that we've had all along. It's never changed. Right. Didn't realize that. Usually, you well, know. When I, when I put out the agenda, I was not aware that we were going to do, it was going to be, we had to have the agenda out early because it was a, um, it was a holiday. It was Juneteenth. Right. And, and I did not realize at that time that we were going to be um, doing both Zoom and in person. So it, no, it was not on the agenda. Right. So that's probably why people aren't there on Zoom. Thank you, Patrick. <laughs> it was all wrong, not me or Sally. <laughs> Thank you, Sally. All right. Someone wants to pull lily pads in the Stockbridge Bowl. Mm -hmm. Yes, Dr. Zern um, contacted us about um, bringing in a dive team to pull lily pads from Stockbridge Bowl and around his stock. And I got in touch with Mark Stinson, but I never heard anything back about what we needed to do about that, whether he needs to file a notice of intent to do that work. I would imagine so. It's land underwater. Um, and it's native vegetation. And it's native vegetation. So and they'd have to definitely delineate the area right. they're going to do it in. And theoretically, the state owns the property that he's considering doing the work on. Mm -hmm. So it's complicated. So just telling you it's still being considered? Well, they're not here or anything. Yeah, just, yeah he's not here. This I, is for our discussion to see how to go about it, really. All right. So that's it then. Um, I will get in touch with him again and say we still don't know and and that I suspect that he will have to file a notice of intent. Um, again, it's not his property that he's talking about doing the work on. So I, I, I just don't know how he would go about that. I, I really have no idea because it's not his property that he's talking Others, about doing the work on. I think that uh, or some organizations around the bowl though have hand pulled in the past, haven't they? 
I'm sure they have. Mm -hmm. um, but now that he's asked. Yeah, yeah I know exactly. <laughs> which, of course, is what we want. Um, but I guess I, I would like to see, I, I was hoping to get from Mark some guidance on how to proceed and if there's some sort of um, generic or um, you know, overreaching notice of intent or something that people could join in on saying we want to do this and see what natural heritage has to say and see what DEP has to say. Are there repeated questions that come up about the bowl? I mean, you know, it's, it's all still pretty new for me, but I'm wondering if you could ever get Mark here with a list of questions that yeah, this is this is new. This is a new one. I mean, we've had questions. We've had people want to put down a benthic barrier in the past, and there have been some questions about the microorganisms that are down underneath and whether and how large an area you could do it in because you don't want to be killing all the little microorganisms. Mm -hmm. um, but we haven't heard anything about that in a long time. Mm -hmm. um, I know that um, Lake George pulls by hand. Mm -hmm. um, but they're pulling invasive species. They're, they're pulling the milfoil in Lake George, um, not the native plants. And, you know, we understand that the lilies are sometimes difficult to pass, but they are native plants. And so it's hard to know what to do. All right. We'll wait for some more information on that. The bird sanctuary, the foot bird sanctuary. That, that was Roxanne. Yeah. It's, I guess I have it's the know. area that the highway department oh. has parked all their debris on, mm -hmm. and it runs up as far as the Grange, I believe. Wow, is that big? I'm not sure on the acreage. Yeah, I don't know. So, your your knitting, knitting is stuck to me because I have it in my pocket. Sorry. <laughs> but now you're not on TV. Oh, I have to go over there. You have to go sit <laughs> next. Have to be on TV. I'm close enough to be heard. No, you. That's okay. You can sit wherever you want. I okay. Uh, how about here? We know who you so, are. So anyway, um, we checked with Donna. There is a deed restriction on the property, so there can't be any swapping. Um, because we talked about that at some mm -hmm. point as a possibility of taking a little strip and then giving, you know, acreage in return. Acreage yeah. return. That can't be done. However, um, because the Conservation Commission manages that property, um, what we were thinking is what we'd like to do is take down the structure that's there. It's on a concrete pad um, and then be able to put a prefab building on the pad. So we'd have a brand new building that we could use. Now we could use it as a combined, you know, the bird, the bird and wildlife sanctuary information and also use it for the Talbot Center. So it could be used for information for that bird and wildlife sanctuary in terms of, you know, we can get photographs of what species are there, et cetera, et cetera. We can do some kind of a nice setup, of good information for the public, but also be able to house the Talbot Center in there. Um, and that's would be the extent of the use of the property, period. And everything else is being cleaned up. We're talking to the fire department right now to try to get that trailer, the storage trailer out of there. So that's underway. They just have to find a place to house all their stuff. So we're working on that. And so we will get everything cleaned up off that property. So then the only use on that property would be that concrete pad, assuming we can take down the building, put in a prefab building, and then utilize it for a dual use. Is the current building in the sanctuary? Yes. Okay. So this isn't changing anything? No. And how long has, I should, could look at the information, but maybe it's not there, I'm not sure. So was the building there on her property when she did the deed restriction? Yes. Okay. So this is not changing anything that's already there except for replacing the building? Correct. 
With the same footprint. And it would be adding value to the building. We'd be adding in, in its um, right. in its function as part of the bird sanctuary. Right. As opposed to just being storage for the highway department, it would no longer be storage for the highway department. It would then be used for the bird and wildlife sanctuary and for the Talbot Center for the public good. What's becoming of the Talbot Center that exists? That is not ADA compliant. They poured a concrete walkway, which is not ADA compliant, would have to be ripped out. It's in bad shape. It's in a very um, damp and wet spot. If you've ever noticed, you know, it floods underneath there. So the concern is that there's some mold in there and that this would be a good solution because all we have to do is run electricity to this proposed new building. And that's the sum total of it. The public restrooms are in the highway building itself. Okay. Sounds good to me. Mm -hmm. I think it, I think it sounds like a great idea. Um, who would do the research and on what's there and do we know what's well, there? I mean, should we be doing that? <laughs> In terms of what's there? When you well, you were saying that you you thought, and I think it's an excellent idea, you were saying that you thought that um, we should have some sort of informational, um, oh, you know, you know like yeah. what plants and animals and birds and whatever are there. Um, are there trails? To be displayed, there are no trails. There's, There's no, no trails. Team. We had Tom's team that was doing the evaluation uh, of the wetland areas for us two years ago. We could reconvene them to do an evaluation of the parcels. Who did it? I didn't hear you. Tom Coot. Oh, Tom Coot did? Yeah, he, he helped us do okay. the evaluation of like uh, from Dooley Pond to the causeway two years ago. But not the, not the foot property. No. We're talking about the foot. Bird and wildlife. No, no, I'm just saying that if we needed somebody, we, we can, that's the model to sort of figure out what's there if we wanted to, you know, have to have a biologist and a team evaluate it, you know, so you can get the information you're talking about. All right. Um, well, let's get it all cleaned up and then we'll see where we're at. Okay. In the meantime, um, Michael Canales will be looking for you know, prefab buildings will get costing on that. You know, what's gonna be involved if we can move mm -hmm. forward and have your blessing. And whether there'll be, we'd have to know whether there's gonna be digging and that kind of stuff, or if yeah. it just come up and. Uh, usually they come up. Digging would probably be running the electric. What are the dimensions of the existing building? Of the, the existing building that's there. Was, I don't have those dimensions. I'm guessing, so, I was there and looked at it. I bet you it's 50 by 50, maybe, or it's the big, one with all the well, signs. Yeah. Like that. yeah, square foot. It's two story, ones. but nothing upstairs. I mean, there's nothing. I wouldn't have upstairs. In I know. <laughs> I mean, because it's a board slab right now. You know, a friend of mine just bought a, a, a prefab, pre assembled shed from one of those um, Amish groups. Right. And it wasn't too terribly expensive, but it was pretty well constructed. Oh, yeah. No, it's by far probably the least expensive way to go. Would you try to make it year round? It's huge. Pardon me? Would you try to make this year round? No, we'd probably be, we're talking about three seasons days. again, like three seasons. Right. Yeah. Well, I think it sounds like a great idea. Okay. Personally. Yeah, I can put a small team together to help out. We can shift focus from Cold metals over there. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Friends of Gold Meadows and where come friends of the Footbird Sanctuary. Where does the old building go? Do you just put it in dumpsters or? Yeah, like it's, it's, it's really disgusting. It's not going to move in one piece. Okay. <laughs> now, Bad shape. Oh, I, there might be some value to that because it's. Oh, geez, don't talk about that. It yeah, could be a some salvage, though. If, if it comes down and it has any value, it becomes salvage and we'd auction it off if anybody was interested. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is we might talk to somebody about doing the labor in exchange for the material that they remove. 
or the town excavator could take or it. Or we just not. <laughs> 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 well, it certainly sounds like an improvement, if nothing else. Okay. So. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Roxanne. Okay. Public hearing request. Well. Bernard Hahn would gonna... So that's still um, pending. The Triwalk is still pending. Um, the Housatonic Railroad has in, did they get in touch with you guys? Nothing. I'll have to get in touch with that because I got in touch with them and said, you know, you need to How about figure uh, it out. But okay. Is there anything from Mackinac Terrace? No, I did not. Summer's over before they get that done. Yeah. Um, so I guess it's to the weed harvesting. Jackson, get Jane and out of here before. Where you, you, know. you want me here? That's good. Go stand by John, I think. <clears throat> want a chair? Take your chair over. There. It's been a long day. <laughs> Um, yeah, she's got to them. What do we look? Can everybody see that decent? <laughs> sort of. Um, so, for the record, I'm Jackson Alberti from Foresight Land Services. We represent the town of Stockbridge. Land and water. Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, for the proposed weed harvesting and Stockbridge Bowl. Um, we left off the last meeting with some discussion about. Uh, our previously proposed plan, and um, we had received DEP comments uh, that morning um, and had some discussion of them, but no, we had foresight, didn't have time to formally respond to those. Um, so since the last meeting, we've put together a response letter to those DEP comments. I got some hard copies of it here in case anybody needs those. Um, Thank you. Do you have one? <laughs> so I thought we would just start by uh, going over uh, and addressing the, those comments uh, and Foresight's response to those. Is this, and this does not include National Heritage's comments though? No, I uh, I can touch on that as well. I've got that. But first I figured we'd start with these. Um, okay. All right. So the first comment uh, is basically Mark Stinson requesting clarification on what uh, permitting pathway this is being proposed under um, and whether uh, 310 CMR 10.533L limited project status uh, applies here. Um, <clears throat> as you can see, he in, in his comments uh, is implying that it does not. Um, but in our response, um, we are submitting this notice of intent under limited project status as a water dependent use uh, limited or uh, on land under water body resource area under 310 CMR 10.533L. Um, so then uh, in here we put in some of the language from the Wetlands Protection Act, which reviews uh, the commission's uh, regulations over water dependent uses. Um, so 310 CMR 10.533L states, the construction, reconstruction, operation or maintenance of water dependent uses provided, however, that any portion of such work alters bordering vegetated wetland, which this project is not, um, such work in any other resource area found to be significant flood control or flood prevention, storm damage shall meet the performance standards. Um, as this is proposed, it'll have no effect whatsoever on any flood volumes or velocities. Um, and then uh, number three, adverse impacts uh, from such work in any resource area shall be minimized regarding the other statutory uh, interests for which that resource area is to be significant. Um, so that would be land on the water body resource area in this case. So proposed harvesting of aquatic vegetation uh, as we have it designed. Um, will fit, uh, in our opinion, will fit the criteria of that limited project status uh, by minimizing, minimizing the adverse impacts uh, uh, in land under water body. Um, uh, Foresight works pretty closely with Tom Coot uh, of Otter Environmental Services to develop the proposed uh, harvesting as you see it here. Um, 
Jackson, Tom, who is on? Okay. <laughs> Hi, Tom. Um, we can have Tom chime in here soon. Um, but uh, to the contrary of what DEP states in this comment, number one, uh, it's Foresight's opinion that the proposed harvesting uh, is, in fact, very isolated um, and will have very little impact on the wildlife habitat uh, functions of land underwater body within the bowl. Uh, the total proposed uh, harvesting area of 7.9 acres, um, which on this revised plan has been increased from the previous plan um, due to Mark Stenson's number two comment about uh, harvest around the docks, but we can touch on that. Um, so the pro total proposed harvesting of 7.9 acres is only 2% of the surface area of the bowl, uh, and it's less than 20% of that six to 15 foot depth range, which has been found to be significant for wildlife habitat function um, and has been limited as you can see on our, our plans has some very uh, tight uh, high traffic areas uh, along the bowl uh, into water depths in which rare species have typically typically been found in very low numbers or not at all and that six to 15 foot depth range um, that's uh, why we have it proposed that way and the zero to five foot depth range um, is far more important. Uh, maybe Tom could speak to that of uh, importance to wildlife habitat function. Um, and in addition to that, the harvester will only harvest five feet uh, down below the water surface. Um, so in that six to 15 foot depth range, you'll still have vegetation ranging from one foot to uh, 11 feet tall. Um, if, they, if they cut to six feet deep, why not cut to six feet deep? I, bl I believe the harvester only cuts to five feet. That's the one I think only does um, And that the idea being we would leave still, even within that 7.9 acres, uh, some intact benthic uh, vegetation habitat for uh, rare species like. So there will be vegetation that reaches the surface. Um, I mean, it will eventually grow back up, but in the areas we're going to harvest, it'll be cut five feet below the surface. You're not going to from the five foot depth out as far as vegetation grows, is that the proposal to be harvested? Uh, six to 15 feet. Um, so like in the- So depth, everything after the six foot depth will be harvested? Uh, yeah, out, out beyond 15 feet of water depth, the vegetation doesn't, doesn't really- It's only 2% of the lake. But that's not the whole, the, the map doesn't, many of the areas are being harvested where it's sitting in the map. Correct. All right, so you're only doing certain locations on yeah. the lake. All right. Yeah, that, that, um, that six to 15 foot depth band around the lake uh, makes up a, a significant percentage of the lake, but we're only proposing to harvest 20% of that just 2% of the entire lake. Um, so it's, it's Foresight's opinion that contrary to what Mark Stinson has stated here, we think the proposed uh, harvesting is very limited in its scope of about 2% of the lake surface and is very limited in the effects that it will have uh, on wildlife habitat function of these uh, of land underwater body resource area. <clears throat> So that was our response to number one. Um, we, we are submitting this as a limited project because we believe it meets the requirements for that limited project of, uh, of a water dependent use, which recreation on the bowl would be a water dependent use. Um, we believe it meets those performance standards of not adversely affecting the wildlife habitat of the areas to be harvested. All right, let me just make sure I understand this. <laughs> The areas that you propose to harvest in count, uh, add up to 20% of the total lake surface. No, no, sorry. <laughs> but you're only going to do a certain percentage of those 20. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. So in total, we're only proposing 2% of the entire lake surface. Mm -hmm. Um, and then that 16 or six, sorry, six to 15 foot depth range is uh, somewhat like uh, 40, 43 acres, I believe it was. Um, and we're only proposing to alter 20% of that, of the of that right. band okay. around the bowl, which uh, is significant because that's what's determined to be uh, uh, important to wildlife habitat 
function of those areas, that depth range where those plants can grow. Um, so we just wanted to demonstrate that um, overall we're affecting a very small portion. Of, the vast majority of the lake will not be touched, but in correct. certain areas yeah. will do more. Um, which was the intent of this project is to, to you know, remove nuisance vegetation, whether it be native or invasive within uh, some very specific high traffic areas of the bowl um, and leave the rest of the bowl untouched. Um, so I hate it when people leave everything weeds. <laughs> Can you talk a little bit about your, um, you did a survey, you went out and you did a survey of the lake and the plant matter that, that was um, beginning to emerge at the end of April, as I understand it. Correct. And you went with Tom Coote, who is by all reports, possibly the most knowledgeable person in the country about maybe the world, who knows, <laughs> um, about our little snail. Yep. Um, and can you tell us what what sorts of plants you found? Did you find the um, what did you find mostly native plants? Did you find any invasive plants? And at what percentage did you think they were? So uh, in April, um, I found very limited quantities of curly leaf pondweed or Eurasian milfoil or any other invasive species. Um, those, those two being the main ones we were looking for. Um, found very little evidence of that. I found some small pockets of it uh, in the outlet channel as well as up near the inlet, um, but nothing that I would consider a large population of Eurasian milfoil. Um, it was limited to you know patches, maybe 10, 15, 20 feet across or something like that. Um, and all of which was relatively hard to identify because it was not reaching the surface at that time. It was still several feet down below. Um, Isn't it true that it's hard to identify whether it's the invasive milfoil or whether it's the native milfoil unless you actually take it out and sample it? I would defer to Tom's judgment on that, but yeah, I would say it is, it is difficult to uh, be sure what's what. I didn't find any evidence of, uh, of a native milfoil while I was out there either. Um, by far the most uh, plentiful plant we, I found was uh, floating pondweed, the Potamagetan uh, natins, which is a, a native plant. Um, we found a lot of white water lilies in the, uh, in the outlet channel, um, as well as uh, eelgrass. But yeah, by far the most plentiful plant at that time was floating uh, pondweed, uh, the native version. Uh, very little evidence of invasive species was found. Is that the flat, long, skinny, like the pondweed? Yeah, it's it's kind of got a long, skinny stem to it and flat leaves that'll just fly, lay out on the surface of the water. So anyway, that's pretty much what we found in, in terms of being out there in April. Very little evidence of any invasive species. Uh, I remember back in the day um, when the harvesting first started, that it was a little bit more robust than this. Is that because natural heritage or because DEP or somebody put the kibosh on this? Uh, you probably all know the history of it a little better than I do, but I, I would imagine yes, a bit of both. <laughs> okay, well, you know, I, I'd like to ask Patrick a question because Patrick was one of those who got out there on the harvester and actually went down and did it. Um, it looks to me, reading through this, that it's like one pass at a dock, and that's all that's allowed. Is that what you were doing back when? You mean from the docks and like the outlet around the lake? Yeah. Yeah, we would usually typically do one side of the dock, uh, you know, make a path to the central central channel, for example, in the outlet. Um, I mean, just doing the dock work could take two or three days. Of, there's a lot of docks. No, I know. <laughs> um, but then you mentioned um, swimming areas. Correct. Um, does that mean more? of the harvested area? Yeah, um, in these some specific areas. Uh, I don't want to cover up the mic, but 
We have like the White Pines uh, boat launch here, these specific chunks, uh, which we've calculated the surface areas of here, um, the Stockbridge public boat launch. Um, again, this is all staying in that depth range of six mm -hmm. to 15 feet of depth. Um, so these areas, um, this area down near the, the town beach um, and the Mackinac Boat Club, and those are the very limited areas we've proposed uh, anything more than one path swath with the uh, with the harvester. So these are just literally one swath down yeah, there. Approximately 15 feet wide, right. um, five mm -hmm. foot uh, down below the surface. Um, and those are just proposed as one pass. Um, and that's all included in that, the surface area we created there. Um, that was of interest of Mark Stinson's number two comment was, excuse me, the, the first version of the plan did not include a, uh, some did not include uh, calculations of the surface area related to uh, um, harvesting around private docks. Um, so we've calculated based on the number of docks on the bowl and the amount of surface area it would take to do about one pass around that dock and out to the outlet channel. We've calculated that on this revised plan and that brought us up from 7.28 acres to 7.9. So a slight increase there. Um, there's an awful lot of docks. You mean that's all the increase? <clears throat> yep, it, it was about 200 to 250 square feet um, around each dock, like like Patrick said, just one one pass basically. Um, and of the some 150 docks uh, on the bowl, um, that adds up to what we have here is about uh, 28,000 square feet. <clears throat> If they calculate the entire perimeter, you never can harvest that because the people always have their boats on one side or the other. You can only do the side that's clear. So when they see you come and they, they want you to do the side that the boats are on, they move them all the other side and you do either one side or the other. You know. They have two boats. What? What if they have two boats? One each side, then we skip it. Okay. Hmm. It's not a problem. Boat club always <laughs> goes down and moves theirs when the harvester is coming. Mm -hmm. So anyway, that, that addressed <laughs> comment number two here. We submitted this revised plan, um, and that also addressed uh, comment uh, number four, uh, which refers to Mark Stinson's request that we remain bare minimum 100 feet away from the proposed test plots uh, of the uh, order of conditions. From what I understand, um, they're possibly going to move the test plots. And if they move the test plots, how do we know where they're going to be? They are required to notify us, the town, and I believe the Conservation Commission, if they get permission from the DEP to move those herbicide test plots. Why would they do that? Because they can't get enough milk foil in the plots that are there now. So they're going to gerrymander around until they get some. But Sally, wasn't in the order of conditions that they had to put them in specific places? They they made a proposal as to where the places were going to be. Um, and it, it seems to me that um, this is sort of, this complicates the, the situation significantly. If they're proposing to move the test plots and they have not done that, to the best of my knowledge, nor have they applied to DEP. Correct. Oh, as far as we know, nothing's to move them. We did talk to town council about this. Mm -hmm. So basically the way that we would proceed, assuming that you give us an order of conditions to do harvesting, if we start doing harvesting, as it stands on paper in their final order of conditions, we will completely avoid the predefined test and control areas until we get notification if they do move at which point then we avoid those areas um, but it doesn't sound like there's going to be a huge variance and it doesn't sound uh, based on going out with them that they're going to change probably the control area which is a fairly large area so i think it's going to be minimal impact even if it's moved a little bit okay if they ask dep if they can move why can't we ask dep if we can move it Fair is fair. <laughs> well, my, my fear is, is that, you know, somebody is going to go out 
and discover that there's a patch of milfoil someplace and it's you know concentrated and it's lots of milfoil and they're going to move the well yeah that's a plot to yeah. there that's what they want to do right so i mean you know tell us where the hell they're going to do it and let it be it looks like they have they have that. but now they want to change it <clears throat> well I, from the survey that jackson and tom did there isn't any place like that. I mean, there are little patches that they could find, but it still has to be 50% of the plant population, which from what I understand, it's not. I mean, it potentially over the past, since April, it could have, there could be somewhat more uh, Eurasian milfoil, but based on what we've observed so far, that's just not the case. Is April the time of year where you would find it? Um, from from what Tom has explained to me, uh, late April, beginning of May is a good time to, to get a, a beginning sense of what's sprouting up around the bowl. And then uh, sometime in the middle of summer, sometime in July, probably uh, would be around the peak, I guess, uh, of, of their uh, growing season. Um, so it like like uh, Natural Heritage has recommended in their uh, in their letter, we would recommend uh, a pre-harvest survey um, to get uh, a better idea of if there is any uh, areas. Of so that's something you would do when Foresight and Tom Coops would go out pre-harvest and see. Yep. Uh, Good. Be done with the, I believe it's called the meter square method, um, which Tom I'm sure is very familiar with. And then you basically lay out a meter uh, on the water and calculate the percentage of invasives versus native plants located in that that sample lot um, but uh, as not being able to find any invasive vegetation so far we would think it would likely come up as as mostly native vegetation and when when would you do this second survey i guess that depends on when this when this is approved and is allowed <laughs> to move forward um, well right now all we're approving is the the weed harvesting right correct um, but we have to approve it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I had another question. Oh, um, my, uh, am I incorrect that the, um, the, the survey that was done by the, um, solitude did not include actually sampling any of the plants? That is correct. They did not take any plant samples at all. I had to request samples to be removed when I was with them and I retained they didn't want them, and I retained them, and I took them to Tom Coot, and he identified them. But that was for me, for my purposes. How would you how would you make an identification as to whether it was invasive or native if you hadn't actually taken a sample to look at? Exactly, that would be my point. So that's why I asked for a few samples to be taken. Um, and the samples I had, there was ranunculus, there were two that were Eurasian water milfoil, and there was one that was curly weed pondweed. Um, we didn't see a lot of the curly weed pondweed. Um, there were patches of Eurasian water milfoil in various spots, but um, Solitude basically stood in the bow of the boat and looked down and clicked their GPS when he thought he saw Eurasian water milfoil. And that's how they took their data points. Um, I did ask Richard Seltzer if he would share, they were going to map those data points, put it on the map. Um, and I've asked Richard Seltzer if he would share that information. He said he would share that with me. Um, but so far, I haven't seen it. So I don't know that that's been produced yet. Is the request that you put in to move the plots Am I correct on that? No, the SBA no. wants the to move them. Yes, the SBA wants to move them. And as far as I know, they haven't gone forward with that yet. Okay. Because we haven't seen the data points plotted on the map yet. Well, so it's just a generic request or at this stage? In this at this note. stage, I don't think they've acted on it. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know what the status is. That's it's an SBA project and it's their prerogative. They are allowed to um, modify them, but they do have to go to the DEP to change that final order of conditions and move those test areas. But this turns about the harvester, so. And I would know, I understand. I would think that would be a null point for this project anyway, as the hope is to get this done right. in the next month for starting. Yeah. Well, my con just adapt 
in terms of the weed harvesting. Right. If it changes, then obviously the agreement is that we have to stay 100 feet away from those tests, those defined tests and control areas. And if they move, then obviously we would have to adjust based my, on those changes. My concern is that if they um, if they want to move their test <coughs> based on what they've done, um, that we have we have information as that we get the information as to why they've chosen to do that and that it doesn't hold up the harvesting project because if if we have to wait for them to come around again with a new plan um, before we can start, then that's going to delay the whole project, won't it? Well, yes. in talking to Donna Brewer, she said no. Okay. Um, there's an existing final order of conditions, and until that changes, that's what we obey. Okay. All right. That's what I wanted to know. Um, so, if I could just address Mark's third comment, um, I think it's one of the more important uh, points made, um, and it's regarding the uh, land under water body and waterways, pre CMR 10.564A4. And, um, and we have responded to those comments. Uh, we inserted the text from the Wetlands Protection Act itself here uh, regarding performance standards of land under water body. Um, and Mark Stinson states, uh, report 10.60 requires that a formal wildlife habitat evaluation be conducted by a wildlife biologist or ecologist uh, or a competent professional, i.e. we would say Tom Coop would be the one doing that. Uh, we would argue that we've already started that process by reviewing the, the plants in, in the bowl and have been reviewing the plants and the uh, rare species in years now. Um, so we would argue that that process has already begun and would be furthered by the pre-harvest survey. Um, <clears throat> Is there any sort of survey to be done after the we after the plant harvest? There's a required reporting, um, which is something Natural Heritage just stated in their letter. That's something you do? Yeah, that's something we could do with Tom Coot's help. So uh, then Mark Simpson goes on state, the gold proposed project appears to be complete and perpetual removal of plant species, evidently including native ones, which if significant to wildlife habitat is not permissible by the regulations. Um, so we would argue that we're not proposing per perpetual and complete removal of plants like we've stated. This will simply be taking the tops off and leaving uh, a layer of benthic vegetation habitat. Going along. Uh, precisely. Um, and we would argue that uh, if, like Mark Stenson says, if significant to wildlife habitat, um, we would argue that the alterations that we have proposed are not going to be adversely affecting the wildlife habitat of land underwater body. Um, as designed, the proposed harvesting uh, have no impact whatsoever on the the water carrying capacity or the ground and surface water quality of the bowl. So it meets those standards of the land under water body uh, resource area. Uh, in terms of item number three here, the total proposed harvesting area is 7.9 acres, which I've, I, we went over a little bit earlier, and that's approximately 2% of the entire surface area um, and 20% of that six to 15 foot depth range. Um, and uh, it's been further limited again by five feet of depth into the water and leaving uh, a layer of benthic vegetation habitat. How do you measure the depth where this happens? I mean, you uh, that would be done mostly by GPS and bathymetric data. Uh, it's not like you got a little plumb bob and you're going to five foot here. I don't think it's, yeah. It wouldn't be a perfect science, um, but. Uh, like Natural Heritage stated in their letter, it would have to be done by, by GPS mapping so you can remain roughly uh, within those bathymetric contours of six to 15 feet and the, the areas we have proposed here. So um, there would be some technology involved to make sure that they're remaining within the boundaries um, that we are roughly within the boundaries that we have proposed here. Um, and uh, as stated in, in, our, in our letter, the Conservation Commission, or as stated in 10.564A4, the Conservation Commission has the discretion 
to permit alterations beyond the threshold of 10% of land under water body resource area, provided that the proposed work will have no effects on, or no adverse effects on wildlife habitat. Um, so we, we believe that this project will not have adverse effects on a significant amount of land under water body habitat. The habitat that will be altered will still have vegetation and that vegetation will return within one growing season. Um, most definitely. Um, within two weeks. Yeah. Right. Yeah, so that will, we, we believe it won't create any permanent habitat loss whatsoever. It'll just be, like you said, mowing the lawn, um, leaving a large area of benthic vegetation. No. Are all these points on this map GPS located so that the harvester operator who I guess will have to have a GPS monitor um, tells where he's supposed to be? We don't have like GPS coordinates for you know each point along there, um, but this map can be transferred into a, a GPS so they can uh, the data points shown on here and what's known as a shape file. Um, so that can be transferred to a GPS so they can have this map in the proposed harvest areas so they can just watch their GPS and try to make sure they're staying within the boundaries. Um, so that's uh, something a little iffy about that. <laughs> yeah, we're looking into that. <laughs> yeah, it's, it won't be, it's not a perfect science to, uh, you know, even deep, very good GPS uh, in an open area like that um, get down to within a foot of accuracy or so. I, I mean, you're going to need, foot, a, need a way the, most, the most important consideration here is that for 30 years, we harvested at a far more extensive level than this, oh, yeah. with no degradation to the resource area. So we're talking about significantly scaling that back. And we, we actually have the experience. We don't need to guess about this. We have the experience based on 30 years of work to know that this it does not adversely and significantly impact uh, the resource area for either of these species. All right. I'm, I'm okay with that. And I think Tom could speak further to that, that the, the rare species located in the bowl have not been in decline over the past 30 years since uh, this harvesting has been taking place, like Patrick said, in a much greater extent. Um, so we believe what we have proposed here um, is not going to adversely affect the uh, land under water body habitat functions. Um, so it, it all kind of comes down to that point, um, and it's the conservation's commission to, uh, conservation commission's discretion to decide whether they, they believe this project will adversely affect wildlife habitat or will not. Um, and it's Foresight's position that we've carefully designed this so that it will not uh, adversely affect the wildlife habitat functions in the lake. Okay. Between Patrick. I think it's important to also note that what he didn't do is he didn't put 10.60 on the table and say, we have 30 years of experience that shows it doesn't impact it. And then we're, therefore we're going to use 10.60, which gives us the permission to do well over the 10% or 10 acres if you can show there's no adverse impacts. The town did not come to the Conservation Commission with that approach. The town took a much more conservative approach and kept it under 10 acres, you know, as a, you know, in deference to, you know, concerns that, that, uh, that DP and HESB and, and, and this commission might have related to the project. I have no problems with this proposal. I have no, no problems. questions are, but I have a question. Have, how do we keep it in this framework? Do we have operators? Do we have equipment, whatever, GPS stuff that'll keep us, it's not perfect, I, I mean, GPS on my truck thought I was in Antarctica one day. <laughs> um, we started the search for the GPS equipment, um, which you sh we should be able to obtain pretty rapidly because it's out there all over the place. Um, and we do have uh, at least two people that are interested in doing the harvesting. All right. That doesn't include me, but once we know whether or not we can actually proceed with this, we're obviously not hiring anyone to do harvesting okay. until we know for sure. Would would we have Jackson or somebody on the trial run? 
<laughs> foresight. Can you swim? Because they've sank this thing before, you know. <laughs> be as involved as you need us to be uh, in terms of, uh, you know, harvesting survey and reporting. So mm -hmm. we can be in, as involved as, as Mr. Coots, do you have anything to add? Can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you. I'm just turning you on. Um, I, I don't think I have anything to add just uh, in in a general sense, I would say it's a clarification. Just want to make it really clear that I, I didn't go out with Jack with Jackson in April, um, but we did talk about what what he found, and I did look at materials uh, that Solitude picked up last week, um, and I think I agree essentially with everything Jackson has articulated. I have not been on the bowl yet this season myself. Um, the questions that I have about the ecology of the lake is really the same that have already been raised, which is what is the true extent of the invasive? But I also see that as a separate issue from the weed harvesting application NOI. Um, whether or not there's a 50% amount of milfoil, I don't think that's what the NOI is asking for. I think no. we're asking, you know, Foresight is asking and the town is asking for the ability to harvest regardless of what plants are there, native or otherwise. And as an ecologist, I, I do, you know, we're never gonna say there's absolutely no impact, but I would say it's the equivalent of mowing the lawn and that the town of Stockbridge has been doing this for decades. So I don't see any significant change to the system via this application. I think our concern about the the um, invasives, Tom, is not so much um, how the harvesting is going to affect it, but how um, what might happen uh, in terms of their moving the test plots. Yes, I understand that, and I, I, I hear that. Does anyone have any questions? Yeah, I have one. Um, Patrick, I remember way back when there was some talk about putting um, a conveyor down in the cove and yeah. another conveyor over the causeway or wherever, I don't know, multiple in terms of keeping, avoiding the trip all the way down the lake with the, with the harvester. Where is that at now? Well, uh, uh, first, John, let's, let's bear in mind that we'll probably take only about 10 or 15% of the volume of nuisance vegetation out of the lake than, than what we used to do. This is a very limited map compared to, you know, what we we're basically doing, which was, we see some weeds, we go and mow them down back in, back in the day. So, uh, but to specifically answer your question, there, I, uh, the, uh, uh, the conveyor required access to a truck uh, or uh, the use of a truck to offload it, they required a special kind of trucking license and I don't know much about the highway department of trucking licenses, but the bottom line is Lenny didn't want to uh, take his guy with that had that license and devoted to this project. So we traded the conveyor that we actually did buy at I believe the 2018 town meeting for the blue harvester. And Jane Doffenbach from Macquarie Systems did us a huge favor because otherwise we would have, uh, you know, since we found out sort of after the fact that we weren't going to have access to the truck to offload the vegetation, so the conveyor was kind of a you know, a piece of equipment that was stranded. So what happens to the harvested weeds? Well, we just take them back to the boat ramp and we offload them like we always did. So it's we, now it's not going to matter because it's going to be a whole lot less harvesting than it used to be. And the blue harvester is a lot quicker. Right. It's more right. efficient. Right. You're right. It's uh, over twice as fast. Any other questions? I just had one quick point to raise about uh, natural heritage's comments, which I don't know if you've all had a, a chance to look over, but um, they essentially state if there isn't 50% uh, in invasive species found, no harvesting is permitted. Um, and we responded saying, this is not what this notice, the purpose of this notice of intent is for. Um, uh, in, in my conversation with Miss Deanne recently from natural heritage, she basically filled me in that um, she can't, issue a determination letter based upon Foresight's opinions, um, which was our response to DEP comments. She issued this enforcement or this uh, 
letter based upon DEP's comments and the previous uh, activities in the bowl. Um, so she uh, basically told me they are, they are willing to uh, issue a revised letter that would change these conditions um, pending the Conservation Commission's decision to approve this project. Um, she just had to write this letter basically um, based off of last year's NOI. So are you referring to number one, the target of harvesting in the in her? Yep, number one and uh, also specifically number 3E. Uh, 3E states maps showing the distri distribution and density of SAV submerged aquatic vegetation will be created and harvesting will only occur mm -hmm. in areas where uh, Adam and P. Crispus are uh, individually collect or collectively greater than 50% of the so, so you're saying she's willing to go lower on that? And to, yeah. to just add to that, you know, any GSB will have 10 days after you issue, if, so if you issue in lower conditions, they have every right to come back and say, no, we want it stricter. So it's not like, not like we're, we're not listening to them. They have another, they have another pass at this, you know? Yeah, they based, she basically just told me that they, she had to write this letter based upon uh, Mark Stinson's comments, which were you know, pretty contrary to our notice of intent, the purpose of our notice of intent. Um, but we believe our notice of intent uh, has been designed to avoid uh, mm -hmm. adverse impacts uh, in land under water body area. And we believe it's a, a permittable project through this, this limited project status. Um, so if the commission uh, votes to approve it and issue an order of conditions as is proposed, natural heritage, like Patrick said, will be forced to respond with a revised letter. Okay. So, you've replied to Mark Stinson on all, all, all this? He's yeah. seen your replies? He's seen uh, our DEP comment replies, uh, which we just discussed in, in depth. Yes. We have not received any further comments. That's what I'm doing. He uh, does them usually. One, two, three, in my experience, I, I never received a second round of comments. He issues his comments to help guide your decisions and um, uh, that's usually that. Um, it's I have never really received a second round of comments. But that being said, they do have that ten day appeal period to to issue comments or a, a, an appeal or anything along those lines. Um, I think it. I think it has to be said that um, you know there are many of us who have experienced the bowl at its worst with <laughs> with the milfoil so thick that you had to stop and take it off the keels of the sailboats mm -hmm. before you could even get into open water. And clearly that's not the case now. Last mm -hmm. year they found almost no milfoil at all. And, um, and I think all of this time there has been harvesting going on and the snails seem to be relatively stable in terms of their population, which is small to begin with, but they're hanging in there as are the fish, the bridal shiners. So I think whatever harvesting activity has gone on over the past, what, 50 years or longer, I don't know, has certainly done no harm to the lake because we now have a much more robust native population than we've ever had before. Significantly improved, I would say. So, That's good to know. You know. I did have a question yeah. um, on the page two of Misty's letter, Stephen's mm -hmm. letter. Second paragraph, mm -hmm. she says, we, uh, we note the division reserve the right to consider the vegetation activity cumulatively um, now and in the future. So what what's that time span? That's not clear to me. I, I think she's referring to the first time for, you know, the, the cumulative impact of all of our all of our efforts, you know, all of our activities. Correct. So, in other words, if you know, if they do a whole lake treatment, they're not going back tons of invasive vegetation. They may say that's all you're allowed to do, but I don't think it's really relevant because right now this is the only this is the only intervention that we're looking to permit this year. Other than if the test goes through, which is not at all certain at this point because of the density requirements. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I I, I would agree with that. It's basically just them stating that they, you know, they will review the the past um, for something that comes and, up in the future. They're going to be yeah, and this. all the activities on the bowl, and not just this notice of intent we've proposed. Thank you. Um, so they consider all that in their review. Okay. 
All right. I can make a motion. I make a motion to approve. I'll second it. The order of conditions. Yes. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Great. Thank you all for your time. <laughs> Good evening. Did I ask a question? Yes. Hello? Could, sure. It's Anita Schwerner. Could I ask a question of Jackson? Sure. <laughs> turn it down. I'm sorry. Could we clarify when you identified the um, swimming areas that you're going to harvest? Did you include the cove? Um, the the uh, the swimming areas to be harvested were uh, mainly determined by the, the town of Stockbridge um, by the cove. Um, it goes all the way down there, but it doesn't. It, you know, it, it's a one pass, but it goes all the way to the end of the cove. Okay. Yeah. So uh, it, uh, the harvesting will reach all the way to the end of the cove, but uh, it's not proposed to harvest that entire area. Um, it's it is proposed as, as a one pass with harvester to uh, allow passage for boats um, to get out of the uh, outlet channel. You do have to turn it around and take it back to you. So you take a right turn. You get that parking spot. Okay. I'm frozen. Thank you. No problem. <laughs> Anything else? Quick. Hi, Peter. Can't see you, Peter. You're, out of, the, see you're out of the picture. Anything? What are, where are we now? We are. Uh, we are at the point where we need to sign our um, various okay. things. We have a few. Other business, we have the performance standards and the survey. Um, this survey we want to talk about. All right. Does anyone else have a copy of this or is this the only one? I just printed it out. Um, so can Roxanne can tell us a little bit about this. They had, they had proposing to have Rox, uh, Tom Coot do a survey in July of the plants. And the question is, do we have the money to do it to help fund this? And how much is it going to cost? All right. We need information. I, I mean, Tom can probably answer this. But when I talk to Tom, he's available, I think he said the second and third week in July, if you have the funds to do a full aquatic plant survey and habitat evaluation. Do you have money in our uh... How much does it cost? Tom, can you hear? Uh, yeah, I, I, I hear you. I'm just wondering whether I should be deferring to Jackson. Um, He's gone. He's gone. He's literally gone. Yeah. He's so the cost, the cost is going to be in the in the in the couple of thousands of dollars for sure. Um, yeah. um, you're, you're you're talking about several days on the water of doing the survey plus. Um, many hours potentially of plant identification. It depends on what we find. I think we can find what you need. And does this report come to our committee or just the town? That I couldn't tell you. It's whoever Jackson, wherever Foresight's sending their reports. <laughs> Probably come to the Conservation Commission and- Yeah, we'll each get a copy. Yeah. Thank you. All right, so I believe we have fun <laughs> for that, and I think it's really important. Oh, no, we don't. I've checked. You checked. Yeah. Okay. Is so is there now? pencil us in, Tom. In ink. In ink. We'll do. <laughs> we'll do. <laughs> so, do we need to vote on that? We probably do. All right, I make a motion that uh, we pay for a plant survey. And Tom Coots and Associates. I will second that. Put it up in one minute. No, it takes. Okay. We, if it goes over 10 grand, we have to get them. We have to put out the bid anyway. Is that a couple? Yeah, so, it's a couple. No, we're fine. Um, seconded. I'm seconded. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 We're good to go.
Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. I'll wash up that canoe. <laughs> Will do. And last but not least is the performance, performance standards. standards. I looked at that today. I'm very impressed. It's, I think you're doing an excellent job. It's great. Oh, thank you. I don't know what I hard copies. Oh, good, because I printed it out, but I don't know what I did with it. Do you have an extra? Yeah. Thank you. We've got enough, I believe. Marie, you want Do we have two more? Yeah, I have more copies. I think that. All right. Can I have one? So, yeah. what I the changes I made for um, buffer zones on the second page under substance, what we talked about at the last meeting, and I, I think I incorporated everything we talked about into that section. I'll just take a look at it. Now this is a, this is what package oh. that's different than what that's, this is, right? Yeah, you know, it's that's normal. my copy with the highlights. Then, no, this is what you're No, Patrick gave me this actually. Oh, okay. He took my copy with the highlights. It's, right. it's an old one. Oh, yeah. yeah, okay. <coughs> Any comments on that? Does it look. When you say substance, what does that mean? That was your word. <laughs> oh, no. I could put that in. No, this was sort of like a. Uh, you wanted details. You wanted more specifics. Yeah, I think that was just notes I was taking for the other parts. But I, I mean, you know, we can call it whatever you want. I think uh, I think we just go from nine. If we're already at eight, you could just do nine to thirteen. Okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we can do. That. Maybe I was out of substance. I'm not sure. Um, we can make some action on this because I'd really like to kind of read it, not necessarily sitting at this table. Um, are we going to take action on this tonight? No. And I sent it to you. I sent it to you via email. Yeah, it's, oh, if you sent it to my town of Stockbridge email, it's, it's yeah, I'm lying sure. sometime, someplace okay, in a server, sure. someplace that I don't know. When I when I send out, uh, I have my concom, <coughs> and which includes everybody's individual email as well as their town email or the conservation the group email. Because I know that sometimes it's hard for people to get their town email. Yeah, we'll send it to them. Yay. Yeah. That works. Um, oh, sorry. So we have, you know, we, we meet the requirements of yes. having it be Plastic, on yeah. the server and, and be, you know, public record, but also make sure that the members are getting the information that they need to get. And uh, I may have been very tired when I, if I typed what's under substance, but there's two things I always look at. One is, um, I think that, you know, uh, if you're within 25 feet of a wetland resource area, uh, it's it's unlikely there's any any condition where unless you know where the mulch isn't going to get into the water, get into the resource area. I think that it should just not be allowed within 25 feet of the resource area, unless you see no detrimental effect on mulch. Um, and I and I think that that should also apply to any other substance that people routinely apply to their lawns or gardens, you know, and, and not being very good at either my lawn or my garden, I will defer to what the list should be to you guys, but I just think it should be comprehensive. And my other comment was, I thought we were talking about uh, a two to one ratio if mature trees were taken and a one to one ratio if it was saplings. Or, you know, I didn't know we made that distinction, but I'm happy to. We yeah. did. We did talk about that. Yeah, and one to one um, for sapling. I mean, at least two to one. I don't know. I'll leave it up to you guys. But I do think that if we're going to be cut down twenty inch diameter trees, that you know, a couple of little saplings. Yeah, a couple of two three saplings is at least good. We so, what what have you done about mulch in the past? Because mm -hmm. I know when we. One of the places we walked around the bowl, there was mulch right up to the very edge of like the water. Like 20 Mackinac shores. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, have you have you conditioned that in the past? I don't believe so. It's, it's uh, probably on an as. Okay. You know. I mean, because I, I mean, I would. Per application, I mean, I think we go out and we look at it and we see what if we think 
there there was another site that's over on the outlet that we looked at that they were talking about doing a pathway that was going to be mulched and it was going to be part of it was going to be pretty straight down into the lake and we kind of made them make it more of an s turn so that that wouldn't happen and also to bank it so that Mm -hmm. I don't think there's, that there's an imprecise, the, the idea of a tree being mature is frankly a little bit imprecise. What I would do is, is you know, the same thing that we're guys can claim, which is the diameter chest height. So I would do a chart that says if you're taking out a, a 10 inch tree, maybe you could do one sapling, 10 inches or less. Between 10 and 20 is two saplings. Between 20 and 30 inches is three saplings. You know, so the bigger, the more giant this you know, carbon sink is that they're taking out, the more they have to plant. And I think that having some kind of a chart, I, I don't know what the right ratios are. I'm, I'm sure there's some, some, you know, body of evidence online that we can find that informs that. We can't have that too strict because a lot of these areas, there's just not space. I mean, they take the tree out. Yeah, well, because that's the only, that that was between the house and the property well, line. We create just incentives to be yeah. taking out 40 or 50 inch trees. I mean, you know, it's, it may be hard, but the whole point of what we're trying to do here is to move the needle a little bit on, you know, yeah. what some of these impacts are for basically views. I mean, most of these trees come out because people want to improve their views. And I'm not saying people should have the right to do whatever they want on their property, but, you know, within reason, you know, we're losing a lot. Every, every one of these special permits seems to have two, three, four, five, ten mature trees that, that are sometimes coming out. And and uh, and I just think it adds up, and mm -hmm. you know, but that's just my person. So what if we said similar <laughs> similar native species? So if they take out an oak to put something, yeah, I think the bigger the tree they take out, the more impacts close to this kind of have the original location as possible. Yep. Um, a number two, it talks about replanting through buffer and uh, has required to have seventy five percent survivability after three years, and mortality exceeds twenty five percent after two years. You may require new plantings. Does that apply to the trees as well? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I think this is particularly um, significant if the area where they're removing the trees may have. I mean, on a stream, for instance, or in the outlet, when we did, when they fixed the dam um, along in the, in the outlet, it made an enormous difference because they took out a whole bunch of trees and the trees were shading that area and making it suitable habitat for trout and, and you know, cold water. And then the minute those trees came out, it became, it's, it's relatively shallow. Um, it changed. It changed the habitat by a huge amount. Sure. The outlet. They when they did that, they we had we were mandated to do a dam repair years ago, and it was an environmental nightmare. Yeah. The, <laughs> so do we? This, this planting probably should be as close to the water as possible. You know, if they take out ten trees on their property and. The spaces so in the parking lot the or in the lakefront, it probably should be the lakefront. So it should be as close to the resource area yes. as possible. Or however, as close as the one they're taking out. You know, I mean. Well, yeah, but also we have a chance here to right, to, to do something with the big lawn they have in front of the house and. Okay. And do we want a DBH chart, or is that too specific? Well, I think you could do a simple chart with even three or four lines. Just talk about if it's a giant tree, they have to plant more trees. If it's a little tree, they got to plant one tree. I mean, it's a little bit like common sense. Yeah. Okay. We okay with that? Three or four categories? Yeah, three or four sizes. <clears throat> okay, makes sense. Could I suggest something? Sure. Uh, there's a difference between taking out trees for view and taking out trees for safety. Uh, our experience with you guys in the past is we had to take out three trees basically to protect our house from wind damage. Uh, you did ask us to put in a single tree and we did and it's a rather pretty tree and I'm glad we have it. But I think if you're making general rules, you ought to distinguish between the trees that come out so that I have a better view of the lake 
for myself, I rather resent the three houses that are down at the south end of the lake opposite the island with nothing at all in front of them and trees that might fall on your house and need to be taken out for safety reasons. Mm -hmm. I don't disagree with that at all. Mm -hmm. um, well, you can possibly do that. I was talking to Mark Baber uh, over the weekend, just in general. And, and we're talking about the challenge of, you know, doing evaluation. And it could be that if the tree warden finds that to be a dangerous tree, that it's exempted from regulation. You know, that, that covers the, the homeowner. It's reasonable and allows an independent third party to make the evaluation of whether or not it's a danger. Mm -hmm. I would just touch base with him and see if he's willing to do it. All right. We'll talk about it. Well, just the, I uh, would, I, does that include roads? As well? I don't, I'm just, I'm just reacting to your No, I, I think it's also going to be site specific. You can take down a hazard tree, and depending on the site, still do replacements somewhere else on the property. So I yeah. think it would really depend on the on the site. I think if it's within the the 50 feet, it should be replaced somewhere. automatically. Yeah, somewhere. Even even if it's with a smaller tree somewhere else, I'd still like to see it be replaced. And also, you know, you're ta if you take out an oak and put in an apple tree, mm -hmm. it's a whole different thing. Yep. Well, it's going to be it's all part of the uh, you know, order conditions. And to get your certificate of compliance, you have to show that you follow the rules. So this is only I mean, perfect. are you going to go back and look at this? You can yeah. Yes. Well, when they do the, well, we can't, the problem is, the problem is the only way we actually know that they're using stuff on their lawns. It's when we, when we walk out and we do a site visit and we find nary a dandelion <laughs> and, you know, somehow people don't think we notice that and, and, you know, how you can't really prove it, but you know that they have been putting um, herbicides of some kind on their lawns. You know, they have. But did you talk about getting a, a conservation um, agent or something to check into right. the rules that, that are made? Yeah. Is this, this kind is, of thing part of what you were thinking? Yeah, absolutely. Michael, uh, I mean, this was Johnny's. Michael was looking into uh, uh, either doing something in conjunction with one or two other towns or through Berkshire Regional Planning. Uh, and he was going to bring a recommendation. Uh, to the town sometime in the next okay. six to I mean, this is the kind of thing that that person could yeah. be working no. with. Yeah, exactly. Sure it's great. Yeah. Uh, it's, yeah. And, and if there's and extensive planting, the commission can ask for a report. You know, if, if, you know, after two years, give us a report on what has grown, what has not grown. Well, and, and theoretically, sorry, helpful. theoretically, according to the order of condition, all order of conditions, it's a boilerplate. They have to come back for a certificate of compliance upon completion of the project. Right. That's in every order of conditions. It's not something special that we put in. It's in the, it's in the form. Right. But how often do we not get a request for an order of conditions? Um, sell the property yet. Right, exactly. They go to sell the property and they go, oh, gosh, look what we didn't do. Um, and, uh, you know, and then we get we get something from, you know, 1997 and we have to go back and look at it and we find and you can't tell. How, I mean, how, half the time you can't tell. How can we prevent that scenario? I mean, put a limitation of three years on it? I mean, it is, it is a limitation of three so years. If so if they, do the work, it, if they do the work, they have three years to complete it. Right. If they don't finish the work, they are required to um, apply for an extension. Right. We have not typically, I think we have typically said, sure, go ahead and, 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 um, you know, we approve the extension. I think we need to, I mean, we get bitten in the backside way too many times. And I think that this is one of the things that we need to um, get smarter about, that if we get a request for an extension, we go out and we look at the project and we say, you are not doing what you were supposed to do or this project down on Ice Glen where they decided they just weren't gonna do the replication that they were just gonna, do they were going to do the to do. part that they wanted to do and just skip the whole replication thing. Had we gone back the first time they asked for an extension, you know, or we could have. Back during the project. Or if we'd gone back during the project. 
the sequence of work sequence of help work. with that. Yeah. So but it's going to mean a lot more work on our part. Right. But take a look at that. See what you think. I did make some changes to. <laughs> Anything from oh, and didn't we decide at the last meeting that, that it would be in both the order of conditions and in the performance standards? That is thing. Did, did we decide that? I thought that's what somebody okay. that's what you guys are talking about. That's um that's the one that's up on, on the, the hill. Bank, yeah. yeah. They started working on it. He decided to go back and do what he originally applied for. He originally applied at an RDA and he was gonna do an NOI, but he didn't. And he's taking the fence down. And, right. So he's just doing the work that he applied for under the RDA. And if he's going to do more, he'll come back with a notice of intent. You know, um, on, up to sign. on 2B, I, uh, under sequence of work, mm -hmm. um, It's a little bit. It's a little bit vague. I think that there should be a. I mean, it might be included in the order of conditions, project by project. But I mean, I think that there should be, like for instance, with our favorite property up on Mackinac Shores, there should have been a point where, you know, we looked at everything before we approved it, and we said, okay, at this point. We need to be notified by you that this work has been done. So, I mean, we're not just willy nilly or maybe forgetting to go and check it out. You know, I think it ought to be a little bit more formalized. And I, and I understand. I purposely kept it vague because I didn't know if you wanted to do that for every project. I mean, some projects you're not going to want to, you're not, there's not going to be the need to go see it. Well, that is that is true. Sure. So I mean, but the, thing, the the problem I'm having is is that you know we have these hearings and people come in with their projects and they put the project down on the table and now that we're putting a sequence of work in here, maybe we have a little bit better chance of saying, oh, when you do that, we're coming to take a look, project by project. But I mean, I, I really think we're remiss in not doing that, or we have been remiss in not doing that. Like there are two projects going on right now down in Beachwood. You got my email? You got an address? Well, it's uh, held a Reinhold property is one of them. That's been permitted for a long time. Well, there, I know, but they're working they're on it. Down the house and the... They've taken down the house and they rebuilt the house. Mm -hmm. but, I mean, the project's well underway. I did not stop and get out of my car and look because I was with a friend in his car. And then you go around the corner and there's another project that's right on the lake. And that is just my intuition tells me that, that those two projects are something we should go look at now before all of a sudden they come in and, you know, we, we have a, another violation on our hands that, you know, we're not going to get people to back up and start over again. I, I, we haven't done it. I haven't seen it happen. But I mean, those two projects right now. Ed's done it. Well, right now, those two projects are right for our eyes. So if so, you uh, want that more specific, look at the wording and right around. Yeah, I give, will. Us some, give us some suggestions. What did you say, son? I said, I said maybe we should schedule a ride around. Yeah, I, I kind of think so down there because those two are, I mean, they're weathered, the houses are weathered in, foundations are all poured, silt fences are falling down, straw bales are falling down. I mean, you know, I mean, I could just see that driving by in the car, in the passenger seat, and it's just like. Well, unless the project is completed, the silt fences have to be maintained. Right. It's not. So it's not being completed. At the last meeting, we didn't go through the performance standards for banks, and I had a couple of questions on those. Yeah. Is that is now a good time? Would you want to? Sure. Okay. Um, first, um, when we talk about uh, in, in 2C, right at the top of the second page of performance standards for banks. Um, 
The upper boundary of the bank is, or the mean annual flood level. So is flood sort of the equivalent of high water level at, you know, for, for the lake? Not necessarily. Mm -hmm. what is, so what is the definition of- So the on the lake, the so on the, on the lake, it's bank. We're talking about bank, and this is the bank section. Right, but on the lake, it's bank. Floodplain is a whole different thing. All right, but just speaking for lakes now. This is bank. Right. Should we tell me also defining that as as it relates to high water, low water level from of the lake or pond? Well, there's a definable, there's supposedly a definable level of the bank. I mean, if you went out, you looked at the bowl, it would, there are physical features that would allow you to define. You know, I'm where, talking about like what a lawyer does is they come in and they read the language and the definitions and they say, okay, uh, this is the high water mark of the lake, but it has nothing to do with flooding. And therefore, what you, what you wrote in as your definitions, because it involves flooding, you know, flood levels, it, this is therefore not applicable. So I'm just trying to have as much clarity in the definitions, because with all of this stuff, it's the definitions right. that matter most, if anything, ever litigated. So this definition is straight out of the manual. Okay, but I'm just wondering if maybe it has to do with floodplains and not banks that are border like a lake or a pond. Because the thing we always worry about is what's the low water level, what's the high water level, and that's, you know, like, for example, like on Magnet Shores recently, that's what we were focused on was, you know, the, the water levels. It wasn't had nothing to do with flooding. And so I just, don't want, I just want to make sure the bank isn't defined around flooding. Or if it is, then it's at least clarified somewhat so that this would apply to the lake. But that, that's what I'm saying. The bank of the lake is the bank of the lake. There's no flooding issues. There's no low water. There's no, it doesn't matter if we draw down or what. The bank of the lake is constant. But this is, but C contradicts what you just said. If you read C, it says, it defines what a bank is. Yeah, but a no, bank of a, of a river is different than the bank of the lake. I did not say that. And it's defined specifically in the regulations. It's yeah. defined as the mean annual uh, high water mark. Yeah, Not right. in the lake. And just the word mean means it's an average. Not in the lake. So you're. Not in the lake. Uh, what? The lake, it's a bank. There is a, a, a definable bank. Mm -hmm. In the river, it's, or, or it can be a mean annual high water mark. Because that, that does take into effect flooding. Mm -hmm. I've seen it applied in a lot. It's but I, I may typically be wrong. not. It's, it's incorrect if it is. It needs to be clarified. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. It's not going to be anything. Okay. I will look into clarifying. And then my only other thing is that um, uh, the, the question I have is around creating um, uh, steep slopes. Yeah, sure. yeah, sort of like the the uh, the uh, sort of seawall that kind of approach to reconstructing bank. That you know, I, I think that you know, I, I like what some of our recent applicants did. I think it's very pretty and nice, and I'm not criticizing anyone. However, I think that this should address the question of whether or not we want you know to allow for basically a vertical seawall type of construction because. I'm not sure that's in the interest of the resource area and all the things that we're talking about here. So look at 4B. That's a, that's a habitat issue to some degree. Yeah. But the language they have here is um, basically the commission could approve something that alters the bank up to 10% of the, of the length or 50, or 50 feet of the length of the bank. Well, what happens when the bank has a gentle slope and it goes to a steep slope? I didn't, I didn't, and maybe I'm not reading this right, but I didn't see that in here anywhere. I think I don't understand. So let's say between, let's say between, uh, you know, me and you, we've got a steep slope, and I'm three feet above you, and you're the water, and it's got a nice steep slope out, and someone wants to come in and build a seawall, so it's three feet high where you are, yep. and fill all to here. I and no. I just want to make sure that we are explicit 
in discouraging that. Okay, so <laughs> they can only alter up to 10%. 10% of the slope is length. what you're saying. No, the length, length of the bank. Then they would not be able to build a seawall along that whole area. But well, what does the 10% refer to? Maybe that's of the 10 percent of the length of the bank. Like across the property along the bank or length from no, the along. bank toward the inner part of the property? No, across the property along the bank. Frontage. So they couldn't, the frontage, right? right? So they couldn't build a seawall across the whole thing. Oh, I see what you're saying. So they're limited to 10%, changing 10%. Oh, 50 feet. Maybe add just the word frontage or something there. Because I was thinking you were talking about 10% slope or something. No, no. Okay. All right, good. And there is there is the uh, the capacity of the bank to provide breeding habitat, escape cover, and food for fisheries. Mm -hmm. So breeding habitat, if you're talking about like salamanders or something like that, you've got it, um, or turtles, they have to be able to get in and out of the water. And if they can't, then then you've then you've altered their breeding habitat. Uh and wildlife habitat yeah. functions. It says capacity of the bank to provide important wildlife habitat functions, which of course is breeding habitat, among other things. Uh, Migration. Oh, Just saying. Um, and number five, we currently have a doc bylaw. I couldn't find yes. it. Where, where is it? It's, it's there. It's in, it's actually, it's obscure. Yeah. But it's in the um, area of of dimensions, I think. I, I forget now. Um, who was it found it? I have a searchable PDF. Kate, Kate Fletcher found it for me. And it's it. I can tell you what it is. It's it's 25 feet from the bank. OK. And it cannot exceed 200 square feet. OK. And is it one per property? Because I just made That's that. where we do not have anything clear and i think that's a zoning bylaw thing and i think that is an absolute we have cool. got to get that in so i mean i wasn't even sure that we should put it in here because i didn't know if it was zoned. i don't think that's our jurisdiction i don't think so I, either but i would if i could go into a planning board and jump up and down and scream and yell i would say they absolutely need to address that it's gave some money for consultants, so maybe they will. Yeah, there you go. I mean, really, because you can't you can't have a marina on a property. You just can't have that. We have one piece of property which is not, um, which is which is not um, an ex auxiliary. What is it? Accessory use, because there's no house on the property. That's crazy. And they have three docks. <laughs> Two of which are unpermitted by us. I can tell you that for sure. Right. Um, and one of which has been permitted otherwise. My point is whoever addresses this, Marie or Sally or whoever, uh, I think that you should add language that says the burden of proof of, of uh, grandfathered you know, structures is, is you know, rests with the property owner now in town. I think that they, you know, the folks claim things were put in a certain time. And it's unclear, but in the, in the property you were talking about, it was unclear, like, uh, whether or not it was true. But he claimed it was true, and that was all we had to go on, and that's how it was ruled. We have testimony from one of the neighbors that the latest is very recent. It's like the burden of proof. It falls on the own property owner. You know, so show us. Show us the, you know, show us that it was there. Three feet, which is terrible. So should we take it out of here? I think Put it in zoning? Yeah. Okay. We um, we issued a finding or a For square footage or whatever. Um, I'm really tired. My grandchildren were off the wall this last couple of days. Um, we issued a, a a a finding not too long ago, stating that we would uphold various tenets of the zoning bylaw, which is one of which is the doc permit and the other one is um, um, has just escaped me <laughs> completely <laughs> sorry this is how what was that what is three I don't know it went away 
totally went away. So, what's, are we ready to? Once Lisa does another another you know, kind of update to this, are we ready to bring it to town council? Because uh, she's she's eager to help make sure that what we're coming up with is is reasonable. I also think it would make sense for you to pick your favorite, you know, uh, representative of of property owners. Maybe someone like you know Lori on the legal side and you know Jackson or his boss uh, on the uh, engineering side and I think that before we get too far we should ask for feedback from the other side of the you know from professionals just just so that we we get if we're missing anything obvious it gives them a chance to react and that doesn't have to take their advice but I do think it would be good to sort of you know so I think I think that's fine. I don't think there's anything in here that's super controversial, but I think yeah. that's fine to, to do. Right. So if you want to, if you want to do another know, edit and get it to you, yeah, you can get it to me. I'll get it to John. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Good work. Really excellent. Anything else? Yeah. Thank you, Lisa. I think we're. I think we're good. Make a motion. Can I ask a question because I arrived late? I'm sorry. Um, but you were talking about um, at some point Beaver Solutions? I think that has to do with Route 7. Yeah. Okay. They never came. They, they said they don't do Zoom and uh, basically, we're ref basically refused to come in and get a permit. I don't know. I mean, yeah, it's well, they have to first. They have to get permission. Anything they're going to do with the beavers, they have to get permission from Tri Town. Right, and um, then they have to get permission from us. Second question was uh, Howard's pulling in pulling. He asked if he could, and I said, I, you know, I think that has to be a notice of intent. It's work on land underwater, right. and it's also um, state owned. What state owned? Yeah, it's not his property. Right. Okay. So it makes it complicated. I mean, the land, the the land under the lake is right. really state-owned property. So I don't know how you go about getting a permit to do that. But then, but then the Stockbridge Coal Association seems to have gotten permission to do stuff on the state-owned property. So I don't know. I don't know. All right, so we'll do a drive-by of uh, Ryan Holtz. Give me a Sometime. give me a jingle or something when you're going to do it, will you? Because uh, I mean, it's not only the Ryan Holtz thing, but then you keep going down that road and like three or four properties on the right past yeah. Ryan Holtz. There's um. Unless you're there too, wasn't there? Right, mm -hmm. and that was not the pilling place; it was some other place. Oh. Um, Before you, also, can somebody like do a drive by the boat ramp? You know, that's the six feet of fencing that is that is sticking out, jutting out of the water. I'm not complaining about the chain link fencing, though I hate it. We have a bylaw about it. I'm just talking about the one that jets out over the water. The fishermen all say it's illegal, violates 18 different regulations, and someone needs to just nicely go no. and tell the property owner to take it out. No. I did mention it to the question about who owns that, and I, I'm assuming that that may be a state owned fence. I don't think that belongs to the IRL property necessarily. I don't think it does either. I don't think it was there when people were before. Do you think it was there? It's been there for a decade, many, forever. It's, it's always been there. The Tangwood fence goes into the water too, doesn't it? I, well, it wasn't there when it was right. there. Right. When it was on the first camp, it wasn't there. It came with the next owners yeah. because I think they were feeling that the program people were. Uh, I mean, the public was not were infringing on the property. That's when it went up. So it was if you call, call, call the person on the biggest sports and they can read you the regulations in. You know, uh, in these or they got a member relations to say you cannot have structures that overjut the water. You know, so I don't know who I, owns it, but you're supposed to be able to walk around the lake. Yeah, that's right. I did mention it to uh, Gary Kleiderman. He's mm -hmm. a harbor master. I thought he was the most appropriate person. I don't know where it's gone from there. Okay. 
I asked Gary if he would do a dock survey around the lake oh, also. Um, and he got back to me. He was not, I don't, he was, I asked him if he could come to one of our meetings and I forget why he couldn't, but. Because um, I took the valve away from him. <laughs> um, but, you know, I think we, I think we need some, some, uh, we it's not our thing actually i mean we don't we don't oversee the the dock bylaw but i but the dock bylaw to me is an important thing to keep an eye on and there are some docks that are out there that are you know way longer than 25 feet some new docks too so is it 25 feet out into the lake or 25 yeah. feet? 25 feet out into the lake. They cannot go more than 25 feet out into the lake. And then it can then it can only be it can only be 200 square feet in total. And and it's 110 feet. Was it 110 feet across the outlet? Right. Um, That's the reason it was put into place is so that if somebody had a 50 foot dock on this side, another one on this side, people wouldn't be able to get through. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, I know the outlet has that. I, I mean, it's waterways of the Commonwealth. Something of grandfather, obviously. Yeah. There, are yeah. that are, there are some that are, there are some, there are some that have been there since 1890 that are, <laughs> that are certainly grad, um, grandfather, but there are others that have sort of cre crept into the. Yeah, pick up, yeah. As it's so soon. All right. Joe had a point here before we adjourn. <clears throat> you can go 25 feet out perpendicular from That's the shore, but the 200 foot maximum now kicks in. And if you won't say you go with a three foot wide, mm -hmm. so that 75 square feet you've used up. Now you can go parallel to the shore, for example. Yeah for another 40, 42 feet, if you kept it at three feet. And then with the three you had there, so you can go 45 feet parallel to the shore. I think that's a lot. But you can't, that, that extended, if you can't it, go beyond 25 feet from the shore. Yeah, and it's still, it's- Some lots are barely 45 feet wide. Yeah. Well, if you did a one foot dock, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you go across the lake. Yeah. <laughs> oh, 25 feet up. <laughs> All right, but see, but horizontally, you can basically, you know, so much for people walking around the lake. Yes. Right? <laughs> <laughs> or it could be floating, right? Make a motion to adjourn. I make that a motion. All in favor. Thanks, Steve. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Steve.